Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me today. Um, my name is Adrienne Valella and today I'm going to be talking to you about scaling with the thermal pipelines. But before we get into that, a little bit about me. I'm a rock climber. I've been doing it since about 2002. I love it so much. I actually go twice a week with my family. Um, now, one of the things that I like the most about rock climbing <coughs> is that climbing is all about solving interesting problems. So bouldering, which is the type of climbing that I do, um, the goal is to obviously get to the top of the wall. But on top of that, um, there's no rope attached to you. So we need to get to the top of the wall without falling. Now, sometimes as you try to get to the top of the wall, in the environment of falling, you might hurt yourself. I actually sprained my ankle in March because I'm crutches for two weeks. Um, but that didn't stop me. After two months, I got back into climbing once again. The thing about falling when you're climbing is that each time you get back on the wall, you learn something new about the problem that you're trying to solve. So you take that little extra bit of information with you, and that makes you more well-informed so that eventually you make it up to the top. Now, speaking of solving interesting problems, let me tell you about my new job. So by day, I work for BMO as a DevOps Practices and Standards Lead. And in the true spirit of solving interesting problems, one of the problems that my team and I are solving is about solving DevOps at the enterprise level, which can be quite tricky. Now, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the DevOps promise. So in a nutshell, the DevOps promise tells us that we're supposed to deliver faster and deliver safely. However, when we add the extra dimension of enterprise DevOps, it means that we're dealing with compliance, security, and scale. So from a compliance standpoint, it means we need to keep our regulators happy. From a security standpoint, well, we've got your money, so better be secure. And finally, from a scaling standpoint, well, we've got 1,500 applications, thousands of developers across multiple continents. So how is it that we scale DevOps? in an enterprise. And before we answer that question, let's look at the software delivery lifecycle. So in a relatively small organization, when we're delivering software, we do the usual thing of we're managing, we are configuring, planning, creating, verifying, securing, packaging, and finally releasing. Now, when we add a DevOps CI CD pipeline to it, we can cover that automation in the blue part in the diagram over here. And that is supported by a number of DevOps tools. Now at my organization, you can see these are some of the tools that we use, but you can replace some of the tools like consoles, you can replace it with GitHub pages. Um, Bitbucket can easily be GitHub or GitLab. Bamboo could be Circle CI or Jenkins. Artifactory could be Nexus. OpenShift could be EKS or AKS. And then all of that is supported by our DevOps CI CD practices. Now, in a smaller organization, creating pipelines is a slightly simpler problem to solve um, because you can just hire one person or a small team of people to manually create pipelines for you. And that could be, um, it, it's probably not a very daunting task and it's fairly easy to maintain. Um, however, if you were to do the same thing in a larger organization, imagine you're creating a bunch of manual pipelines in a large organization with thousands of applications, thousands of developers across multiple continents, and all of a sudden you've got duplication of work, you've got maintenance nightmares, you've got automation sprawl, and so all of a sudden you're faced with this where you've got a bunch of little tiny DevOps kingdoms, which makes every day feel a little bit like a struggle, like you're ice skating a hill or climbing up a mountain. And now, if we think back to our DevOps promise of delivering code fast and safely, um, what was happening was we weren't meeting that promise. We were failing at that promise. And so it led to this. Hurt. Um, now, as a result of that, it forced my team and me to take a step back and think, okay, 
what do we need to do differently? Because, okay, we've got the automation in place. We've got all these funky tools, but why is it that we are not fulfilling our DevOps promise? And the solution that we came up with was da -da -da, ephemeral pipelines. So you might be wondering, okay, what's an ephemeral pipeline? So in a nutshell, an ephemeral pipeline enables dynamic configuration of compliant and secure pipelines, enables dynamic deployment of pipeline as code, dynamic upgrade of pipeline with new capabilities when they become available, dynamic destruction of the pipelines on project end. It's corporations who work not on a product level, but on a project level. Uh, we have dynamic destruction of pipelines, sorry, uh, we have sharing of best practices as code across multiple teams. Now, the best part of this is we can create hundreds of pipelines in minutes. In fact, it can be in less than 10 minutes. So how do these ephemeral pipelines solve our problems? Well, first of all, we automatically create those pipelines. Remember, in our smaller organization, we could get away with creating these manual pipelines. But in a large organization, we have to be able to create them in a repeatable manner. So as soon as we automate that pipeline creation, we have that. They're fast. Remember, we can create hundreds of pipelines in less than 10 minutes. And lastly, we can share these pipelines easily. We are honoring DevOps by basically defining our pipelines as code. And because we are codifying things, it means that we can share our patterns and our best practices in code. So if we have a team that comes to us and say, hey, I figured out a cool way of integrating Sonar Cube into your pipeline, we can codify that, and then we can share that with other teams who are using our pipeline. So this slide describes a summary of the current capabilities that we have in our ephemeral pipelines. So first off, we've got some coding patterns that we put in place. We support GitFlow and GitHub flow. And in particular, we put in some checks and balances, some guardrails, if you will, to make sure that developers don't do stupid things. So for example, in Bitbucket, you can actually accidentally delete your develop and your master branches. So we put in some checks and balances to prevent you from deleting these by accident. Um, we've also set them up, set up our repo so that when you merge into master and develop, you're forced to do a pull request. Again, we don't want people doing things without another pair of eyes looking at what we're doing. Uh, we've developed a number of build patterns. So we support Java build patterns specifically for Maven and Gradle. We've got build patterns supporting Python, um, Angular, and Node. And we've got build patterns for building Docker files. Um, for, in terms of uh, binary management, what we've done is we use Artifactory and we've separated it out so that um, everyone has a, a snapshots repo, a release candidates repo, and a releases repo. And again, we're honoring DevOps principles by basically saying, okay, we're building once and deploying multiple times. So basically, whenever somebody integrates into the develop branch, it'll build your code, create your package, and publish into your snapshots repo in Artifactory. Once you're ready to go to QA, your dev lead will then take that package that's QA ready and will promote it to the snapshots repo. And that package can be deployed to your QA environment. And then finally, once your QA is done, you think, okay, you're ready for prod, then your QA lead will promote that package from release candidates to release, knowing that this package is prod ready. Whenever you decide your prod date is, it'll be good to go. Um, from a deployment standpoint, what we've done is we've automated the bootstrapping of our OpenShift environment. And that means basically automating the creation of OpenShift projects and creation of OpenShift objects. So we create things like, like image streams, build configs, deployment configs, services, secrets, config maps, all in a standardized way. Because, I mean, if you try to create all this stuff using the YAML templates in OpenShift, you'll want to pull your hairs out. So we made it nice and simple for you. And finally, the part that we're working on next is automated compliance, traceability, and reporting. And so the idea here is we, uh, we basically populate your build.info file um, as you create your pipeline. So you have that traceability as your code moves through the pipeline. And we also, at the end, um, when you're ready to push your code to production, um, we have basically release notes that are automatically published to Confluence for you. So now all of this, what we wanted to do is 
um, help you define the pipeline in as simple a manner as possible. So we have four magical YAML files that enable this to happen. So first, we have a profile.yaml, which basically um, defines your project, contains the project metadata and your tooling definitions. Then we have our secrets.yaml.gpg, um, where we store our pipeline secrets, and it's GPG encrypted because we don't want any clear text passwords in our bit bucket repos because that's bad, and info security will um, run after us if we uh, if we do that. Um, build.yaml um, is a file that basically is uh, used to define our Bamboo build plans as YAML, and one of the cool things that we did internally is um, Bamboo has a, has a Java API for defining your builds as code, and they also have a simple YAML API for doing the same, but um, the YAML API is very simplistic, so we actually wrote a wrapper um, around the Java API so that you can define your Bamboo builds as YAML, so it's way cooler than what Atlassian gives you, FYI. And then finally, we've got our app compose.yaml, which basically does all your OpenShift uh, definitions, and that's the file that's read for all your OpenShift bootstrapping. And so we put a lot of the patterns in place for you so you don't have to navigate those heinous, long OpenShift template YAML files. So once we have all these files um, defined, then we can create our pipelines with a simple command. And likewise, we can tear down our pipelines with a simple command. And because it's all defined as code, we can do it as many times as we want um, with the confidence that you can create and tear down your pipeline knowing that you're going to be creating the same pipeline the same way every time as long as you keep your code the same. And because it's codified, that means that if Joe decides to change your pipeline definitions and it breaks stuff, then you can yell at Joe for it. So that's basically the nature of ephemeral pipelines. Now this next slide, I'm gonna to touch upon it briefly. Um, I will say this, um, this slide talks about our enterprise release forking, which is something cool that we came up with in lieu of enterprise release trains. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on it here, but if you have questions about it during the q and A, and I'm more than happy to go uh, over it in detail. And finally, I want to give a special shout out to my super awesome team. Um, we, uh, I, this work that we've done wouldn't have been possible without any of these folks on the team. We are a team of highly skilled software engineers with deep DevOps knowledge. Um, I feel like we're always learning every day. I mean, my knowledge of DevOps continues to improve every day that I come to work, and it's been super exciting. Um, DevOps is my life. I feel like it's been my calling um, in my career, so I'm super excited to be part of this. So just want to give a shout out to my team, um, and I want to thank you for your time this evening. Um, here's my contact info if you want to reach out to me. Um, contact me on Twitter, LinkedIn, email um, to have a chat about DevOps. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. And I'm also going to invite my partner in crime, Bernard, to help out with the Q&A. Thank you very much. Sorry? How long did it take you to put this oh, structure together? Well, like, so did you start? it's been a journey. So we started, what, like three and a half years ago. And the, the interesting thing about it is um, I feel like the first couple of years were basically all about just understanding the landscape in the organization. We're doing a lot of like piecemeal work, going to different teams, discovering different things about how the organization worked. And it wasn't until like around last year in like March that we finally had that full picture of how things worked in the organization. And we realized that we kept repeating ourselves in terms of what we were telling different teams to do for different DevOps patterns and best practices. And we thought, well, that's stupid. Like, why don't we just codify this? And so um, once we had that, then we started coding. So it's been about a year of, of coding. So and it's been evolving pretty much ever since. And I'm not going to say extra stuff. Um, so I think um, one of the things um, with that I basically came from, I started a culture and then went to the bank and was doing wasn't saying anything. <laughs> But then one of the things we found out quite quickly was that the documents and all the cool things you read about DevOps are places like Google and Facebook and Instagram and stuff. 
does not apply at all. Like you literally have to change the organization structure itself to make that happen. And I'm not the CEO of Vivo, so I can't flatten the organization. But what we thought we could do, which was the cool part about DevOps, was that we had code and basically we had all these cool tools and we had, we didn't get Kubernetes, we got um, open shift, but we, it's good. So basically the way that this thing works is basically we could spin up containers that do compliance on a large scale. We're talking about a lot of teams, a lot of vendors. Um, so that's basically the way our pipeline works. So um, I think we're using the term pipeline as code a lot. Um, what I want you to think about it is not the little circle CI build structure that the actually built. This is basically the API code into whether it's circle CI or it's Jenkins. So it actually developed it, that's where it comes from. So it's very as basic code as it is. So that means we can spin out any type of build system that you want. And it also secures us because other problem the bank has is that currently they might be doing bamboo as their build agent, but tomorrow they might move to Jenkins, they might move to GitLab, and this is late teams so having to change for no reason. We can just basically have a translator that translates one device in the build.yaml to any other system. So it's a high abstraction of, uh, on, on it and it seems to solve the problem well. So we can bootstrap any environment, any build at that go and it saves tons of money and it's quite scalable. So, kind of stole my question, oh, but uh, yeah, so I'm sure BMO has like a lot of independent teams that like, at the end of the day, really don't have much to do with each other other than it's all under the umbrella of BMO. How like, are these teams able to be autonomous <coughs> and like decide their own tools? You mentioned that you had like specific standard builds for different types of applications. What happens when someone wants to deviate from that? So what we found out was that the issue was not, and that was the big thing we fought against because teams wanted some autonomy in terms of what they built. And, and that's not what we're saying to them. What we meant to, to them, or uh, what we're saying specifically was that, let's say you basically want to design a particular build system. Our job is to make sure that build system or whatever it is, delivers, it's faster, it's safer, there's compliance rules. And most of those teams, the issue was that they didn't know what those compliance rules where they just wanted to put something together. So what we did was is just provide a scaffold of what it should be. And then it would allow you to develop what you want to develop. But in a large organization such as BMO, what you're probably being what you are probably doing is being repeated by somebody in the UK or in the States. Um, and so then the case was that then do it as code so that if somebody wanted to build off your idea then we could share it across rather than they uh, having them to contact you and take your time for more valuable work. So that's the difference in terms of how we set it up. Your work is cold, it's a pattern that it works really well, it's helping your team, but then we need to distribute that working idea across the entire bank quite quickly because you solve the problem nobody solved. So that's basically the concept that goes with it. And we don't stop anybody from doing it, we just want it in code, having a, a place that people can just have access to that and use that as well. So we don't repeat it ourselves. Um, we do have a centralized tool stack, so that helps. That was one of the initiatives like when we started, that everyone in the organization is using that same tool stack. So then it made it a lot easier for us to develop this pipeline as code, knowing that everyone's using the same tools. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, how do you Foster Dutch and how did you get all of the teams since there are a lot of very probably distributed teams all over the place uh, to follow your, uh, your standards and using the, the pipelines or like the temporal pipelines that you have set up? So I would say that um, our job is part time developer, part time marketer. So we actually launched a huge internal campaign in the organization. So we use Yammer, for example, internally, and we use Confluence. And I thought, okay, well, Confluence has a blogging feature, so I'll just pump out a bunch of different blog posts. So my whole team and I, we would pump out different blog posts promoting DevOps, um, the merits of it. Why do you care? Why, why does it help you? 
and at the same time cross posting on Yammer and it was kind of cool because last year like Bernard and I went on a couple of road shows across Canada and the US and we had like a little booth promoting DevOps and people would come up to us and say, hey, recognize you from your Yammer post. So we're actually getting people really into it and we hosted like some internal lunch and learn. So we'd buy a team's pizza and talk to them about DevOps. And luckily there are also some tech-minded um, executives high up that saw the value in what they were doing sorry, what we were doing, and decided, okay, you know what, let's include this stuff as part of our mandate for the year and, and make it part of our deliverables to help accelerate our delivery. And also, uh, one of, um, we are, um, I think we strongly believe that if we're delivering faster, there's no argument to that, right? Uh, we can bootstrap having not only all the settings for your your Git repo, we can bootstrap your entire environment with build, and then we can bootstrap your entire environment in less than a second. I mean, you can choose the model over here, and I mean, that's all choose what's we can bring and that. So, yeah, we, we wanted to win the argument both on merit and speed and safety and compliance, rather than, you know, it being another enterprise, just another enterprise mandate. And so far, uh, we're winning and having people come on board. So. Uh, I have a question. How did you solve the problem of versioning in CI/CD mode so that it's symmetric but not that manual? So one of the things uh, we our biggest problem was that um, a bunch of users were using timestamps, um, and in a large enterprise. So when we say deployment, and I think that goes for any probably large enterprise or banks, uh, we're talking about one deployment is multi-teams, uh, multi-applications. So they just don't deploy just one app, they're deploying all the way till the mainframe, all the, in terms of the stack. And the biggest hack, which was the, the, the best success story for them was not even the technical stuff, it's basically agreeing to do semantic version. And that's the key thing. So we intentionally put rules in the builds that uh, especially when it comes to, because we use Artifactory, so if you build something that's the same thing, Artifactory will reject it, will break a build. So some, some things we don't want things to get past that, right? So um, that encourages semantic version. And so some things we don't renegotiate around it. It's easy to go to production and say my application is 3.3.5, rather than my application is my app 2019, God knows when. Right, it, it creates a lot of mistakes. Deployment, deployment in the back is really costly, and your just that timestamp because somebody just got that wrong could just stop an entire deployment. And so, um, some of these things are becoming much more apparent to them. So, most enterprises mirror ecosystems of small organizations, and we all know how semantic version has helped us do quick work. So, that's basically some of the things. So, some things are just basic rules you can get past to encourage the correct habit and we get that you get that feedback more quickly. Um, so those those are the things like it includes tagging and it also allows us to get compliance things just around what exactly what you're doing. So semantic versioning for the enterprise is the whole level of religion, especially if you're using a more um, our platform to do it. So we just use basically a bump script, yeah. 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 And and basically like for Maven builds, for example, we disable, like, or don't, yeah, I guess we disable and discourage the use of snapshots when you're naming your packages, because yeah. we want you to stick with semantic versioning from start to finish, because basically the stuff that's in your snapshots repo is gonna be the stuff that ends up getting promoted to your release candidates, so, and that just, again, puts in some checks and balances to, to ensure that people are following those rules. Just a couple of questions. Have you open sourced your solution? And um, do you, every team takes their uh, snowflake? How about some of the challenges that you had? Um, so, in terms of uh, open sourcing it, believe it or not, we have we've spoken to. Uh, Leadership is because open source in the bank 
um, they're not where we are at. For most of you, we're like just so we have to go through a whole bunch of um, different, channels. different channels to get approval for it. So we are working aggressively on getting this open source because it's pretty simple in terms of how it works. Um, because of how it really works well, um, we are even thinking that um, when that's moving to cloud, especially KS, no developer has to stop doing their work, just that it deploys somewhere else, right? So we abstract all of that. But we are trying desperately to get them to price and understand the value of open sourcing and, and also letting them know that we're not revealing any account passwords in it because it's not in it. But we are working on it. And we'll post it on the Slack channel. Um, I was just wondering, uh, a lot of teams tend to think that they're just a uh, snowflake and uh, how do you convince them that, um, they can, you know, <laughs> that they're, uh, they should use this uh, solution? Well, we think that the snowflake idea has to be a particular outcome. So if you're a snowflake and you're getting bills to, from minutes to seconds, that's a good snowflake everybody can you know, they let it snow on all of us, right? Um, it has to provide a good outcome. So instead of having a debate about how unique your stuff is, the question is, is it better? And if it's better, we will throw everything out and do what you're doing. But I mean, we can't say in 2019 how you build your Java, JavaScript, uh, Ruby is fundamentally the very reinvented the wheel on it. That is, that cannot be true. Unless you have something in it that makes it faster. And that is not an application. That's not a pipeline concern. It's an application concern. So it's not like theory. It's only as good as you know you've done some some special aspects about the way you zip your file or the way you basically pack it. In. You cannot unless you write rewrite the zip or rewrite the hard or the system in a better way. Right? So um, usually the way we deal with it is again very respectfully just proves that you can have a better time. And if you have a better time in your build, then we all adapt it. Just, just wait that with providing, uh, providing something that meets the kind of I would also add that, you know, sometimes it, it's really tough, like when we come to a team and say, hey, like, we've got this thing to create an automated pipeline. They're like, but we already have a pipeline, so why should I use this? And really the compelling reason is, well, first of all, we can just uh, first of all, we can codify your pipeline. So if someone leaves your team, um, that knowledge doesn't leave with them, right? It's, it's in your Bitbucket repo. And um, secondly, it, um, it, it basically ensures that, you know, um, you can recreate a pipeline anytime you want. So uh, it, it does become an exercise in logic. Sometimes it involves convincing multiple people on the team. Um, and sometimes it's, it's a battle that you lose, sometimes it's a battle that you win. At the end of the day, we go for the FOMO approach. Um, we have enough people using our pipeline as code. Um, you know, the teams that are a little bit skeptical will go, oh, it's really cool, I'm going to want it, and, and they'll start using it. And for those who want it, then it's, it's awesome, and, and they'll continue to support us. For those who don't, you can't force somebody to change if they don't want to change, so. Last question. So I just have a question for scale so that uh, we can put it in context. How many teams, how many projects, like, I don't know, just give us context, what's the scale? So I would say that, um, so our current project um, affects the, the, the sizes. We're talking about something on it. So it's, we call it most, I'm um, just trying to see what is the most simple in this city. We have, so you can imagine that a CI area would be, um, would be the size of, uh, at least you have for one team, 300 people just on one stack. And we're working on six stacks. And each of these six stacks, um, they have concurrent projects. So within, um, as they go, you're going to have multiple pipelines 
generated <coughs> just for that stack. So it's quite impressive. So call it a startup, a mini startup in the organization itself. So we are focused on that particular area in Vivo. So all the front end stack, mobile, all the apps you see when you go to the interface, all the way down, that's the scale we're looking at. That's awesome. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>